Anyone who hangs around churches has heard of the parables of Jesus. We are familiar with their language. We speak of helpful neighbors as good Samaritans or label wayward youngsters prodigal. Uh, we employ the word talent because of Jesus' famous parable in the Gospel of Matthew. And even if the preaching is suspect, as it often is around here, we have heard Jesus' parables expounded from the pulpit. We have studied them in Sunday school. You know, you spend enough time around churches and even the lectionary will handpick for us, one at a time, Jesus' parables to ruminate upon. You know, before I complete Jesus' first line from today's parable, there was a man who had two sons. Our minds have already fast-forwarded to the conclusion. We know how this episode will end. And don't you feel just a, a little bit, sorry, just a little bit... For the fool behind the pulpit pretending as if we have never heard this parable before, ever. I mean, we know the limits of calling this parable the parable of the prodigal son. Because we notice that the, the father's display of mercy and grace upon the youngest son's return seems just as extravagant and wasteful. Years ago, I was set to preach on this parable, and a parishioner came up to me before the service and, and said to me, you know, Pastor, we have heard this parable from every possible angle. They never mentioned mother's point of view. I mean, they even had heard a sermon from the perspective of the pigs. I don't know how you make that leap, but they, they did. I agree with the old proverb. Familiarity breeds contempt. You know, this morning, instead of belaboring Jesus' longest and most well-known parable line by line, I thought it might be helpful to observe some of the more peculiar aspects of this parable. You know, at a glance, everything about the parable of the prodigal seems fine. However, if we dig around in Jesus' parables, we are bound to discover something that is wrong. We are almost assured that we will find something that does not make sense. We are almost guaranteed to see something out of the ordinary. And biblical scholar David Buttrick suggests that when we do, what we are experiencing is the extraordinary grace of God. You know, after we are told there was a man who had two sons, Jesus offers a rather peculiar line saying, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And it is a bold yet strange demand. You know, one's estate is usually transferred upon one, or after one's death. I mean, nothing in the Old Testament even hints that the younger son's request is ordinary or even typical. In Sirach, one of the Jewish writings found in the Catholic Bible, it specifically states in the 33rd chapter, it is foolish to dispose of one's property to heirs prior to one's death. And I suspect that the eyes of the Sinners and tax collectors were enlarged by the detail of a son's demand. And if it wasn't against our own United Methodist social principles, I would bet that the Pharisees and the scribes' mouths dropped open in horror at the son's request. Essentially, the son says to his father's face, I wish you were dead. He says to his father, I, I don't want you, I want your farm. I don't need you, I just need your animals. I don't want you, I, I want your crops. I don't need you, I just, I just need your servants. One Friday night, my freshman year of college, 
I returned home from work to an empty dorm. And I had never heard of the desert mothers or fathers before. They were a Christian hermits that lived out in, the, in Egypt in the 4th and 5th centuries. And on that night, I, I happened to stumble upon a line written by Abba Issos. And Abba said, seek God and not where God lives. That was the exact line that ruined me 20-some years ago in Carpenter Hall. Tuesday night on my return from a meeting in Lakewood, as I drove down 394, I was mulling over Jesus' parable in my mind when the words of the desert father crept back into my spirit. Seek God and not where God lives. And honestly, I had never realized how the son's peculiar demand of his father parallels our own prayer requests to God. I mean, have you ever wondered what our prayers might sound like in God's ear? Perhaps the, the parable of the prodigal gives us an uncomfortable soundbite. We have a bad case of the give me's. We talk about that with our children all the time. Lord, give me your stuff. Lord, give me your blessing. Lord, give me your heaven. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me that. Give me my share of the estate. And then the simple yet profound words of the desert fathers find us right smack in the middle of the Lenten season. And remind us what we already know. Seek God and not where God lives. You know, the father divided his property between his two sons. And Jesus tells us that not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. Geographically and uh, psycho psychologically, the son distances himself from his father, his older brother, and his whole community. And far from home, Jesus says there he squandered his wealth and wild living. You know, interesting, Jesus never explains what is meant by the phrase squandered his wealth and wild living. Like the disgruntled older brother, we are quick to offer a theory that his brother must have squandered his wealth with prostitutes. But we have no proof. Biblical scholar Craig Bloomberg uh, suggests that this wild living could be described as reckless or careless. You know, maybe the younger son lived without thinking and spent more money than he had. Annie Dillard offered a pearl of wisdom when he said, or when she said, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. And perhaps the parable encourages us to see, to ask ourselves, how do I spend my days? Is this the life I intend to live? You know, none of us are surprised to learn that after the younger son had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. You know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Now, I think it was two years ago, this was illustrated to me by my younger brother, Brandon. Uh, Brandon had a full-time job at a plant in Batavia. And the relationship with his longtime girlfriend had ended. And my brother had nowhere to go. So he picked up extra hours at Target. And he slept in his car in a Walmart parking lot at night. He purchased a membership to the local Planet Fitness not to work out. No, he wouldn't do that, but to have a place to shower. And much to the horror of my mom, who found out after the fact, my brother did what he had to do just to survive. And I suspect everyone in this space knows someone who has enacted desperate measures. Just trying to make it in the world. And perhaps that someone is the reflection we see 
in the mirror in the morning. You know, in Jesus' parable, the younger son does what he needs to do to survive. He hired himself out to, uh, to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Again, I suspect that someone in the crowd listening to Jesus snorted with laughter. And others cringed in revulsion by the son's close contact with Israel's most impure animal. And at his lowest point, the younger son's stomach growls in hunger for the pods that the pigs were eating. And even more degrading is that no one, no one gave him anything. One of my favorite lines in the parable is when Jesus says of the younger son, he came to his senses. I mean, we hear people all the time who need to hit rock bottom before they can clean up their act or decide to sober up. And at the outset, nothing seems out of place with the younger son coming to his senses. But on a second thought, why does Jesus avoid the Greek term metanoia? I mean, why not include the word repentance or repent right here in the parable? Uh, the basic understanding of repentance means to, to turn around or to expand one's mind. Unless the younger son doesn't repent, but merely wants to return to his pre-famine uh, days. To go back to a season when the cupboards were full. You know, the son's well-rehearsed speech includes the confession of guilt. I have sinned and acknowledges the destruction of the former relationship between the father and the son. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, he says. Maybe us older siblings will agree that he does come to his senses. But maybe we find it hard, or we're not convinced anyway, that he repented. I mean, we are quick to point out that if our younger brother does not identify or name his sin, how can he walk in the grace that allows him to live anew? You know, the younger son knows what to expect when he returns to the village. He expects the townspeople will gather around him and carry out what I learned about this week, the cutting off ceremony. Uh, the, the townspeople will break jars. What, what this entails is that townspeople will gather around and they will break jars of coin or corn and wheat and nuts at his feet and declare him cut off or dead to the community. And in his walk of shame, the younger son will face the music for the insults he put on his father and for the sale of the land and for the loss of it. And yet Jesus' parable offers another peculiar line in the response of the father. While this younger son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The Middle Eastern father's behavior is outlandish. According to one Jewish writing, the, the way a man walks shows what he is. And in the Greco-Roman world, it was said that a proud man makes slow steps. And the father shows that he is not a proud man and allows himself to become undignified as he pulls up his robe, exposing his leg. Oh, my goodness. And runs fighting his way through the wall of townspeople to get to his son. Before the son could even offer his well-rehearsed lines, the father embraces his boy and reveals an economy of grace. And in my heart, I cannot help but see a father who ties yellow bows around the oak trees in his front yard as a sign of grace, that grace abounds and that all prodigals of every degree 
can return home. You know, it matters not where their journeys have taken them or what previous way of life they flee. Whether hungry or unable to get the smell of the pig pen off their hands, the father offers or opens his arms wide. He clothes and feeds them and celebrates their return. You know, it is not lost on me that Jesus has told this parable with all of its peculiarities on his way to the cross. The grace extended in Jesus' parable is a prelude to the grace of God that seeks us out. It is a prelude to the grace of God that restores the relationship of prodigal sons and daughters with God, our prodigal parent. It is a prelude to the grace of God that calls us to be like the parable's father. To be more loving, more merciful, more gracious with each other. So this week, let us slowly reread this familiar parable of the prodigal. And notice its points of peculiarity and allow God's extraordinary grace to wash anew over each and every single one of us. I offer this to you this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, This morning, our next hymn is on the screen behind me and in the very back of your bulletin. It's printed there. It's called, Father, I Adore You. And let us sing prayerfully right where we are. We can raise our hands, open them, however we want to just offer ourselves to the Lord as we sing praises to our God. Let us sing together. sing that whole song again, please. The whole song. whole song again.
Thank you.